Hey, how's it going? This is part two of a two-part retrospective on Carnosaur. I uploaded part one sometime last week, and it has a lot of information that is going to be repeated or referenced in this video. So if you're watching this video without watching part one first, then you'll likely be very confused. So I highly recommend watching part one before you watch this one. That way you're not that confused. But I mean, if you're somebody who doesn't care, I mean, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. You can watch this one without watching part one. I don't care. You know, it's your life. You, I don't, you know, I don't have to tell you what to do you, you do whatever you want to do i don't i don't care i don't care what you have a fucking problem huh you have a fucking problem <clears throat> sorry uh th that got a little out of hand anyways uh enjoy the video i'm literally gonna get into this as if there wasn't a week-long break between these two parts so uh enjoy Okay, obviously, you already know that this first movie would spawn several more in one way or another. Literally just the following year, a new dinosaur film would be released under New Horizons called Dinosaur Island. It was released on March 23rd, 1994, and it was directed by Fred Olin Ray and Jim Wynorski under their uniquely titled Win Ray Production Company, though I'm assuming it was still heavily associated with New Horizons. Basically, the story goes that Corman didn't see a reason why they should stop making dinosaur movies, considering Jurassic Park's hype was still very present even after its initial run in theaters. That, and he wanted to get as much money out of his carnosaur props as he could, which makes sense considering the amount of time, work, and money he put into them, at least in comparison to his other films. From the perspective, especially from a B-movie film producer, it would be a waste to not use them as much as possible and get your money's worth out of them. So, he assigned Ray and Wynorski the job of making that movie. For those of you that don't know, both Ray and Wynorski are well known in the exploitation B-movie industry. Wynorski first started out in the 80s, and over his career, he's made well over 150 films, with some including Chopping Mall, Sorority House Massacre 2 and 3, The Wasp Woman, Shark Kansas Women's Prison Massacre, okay, and several more. Chopping Mall was the movie that Wynorski would make for Julie Corman, which Roger Corman liked enough to hire him to make more movies. Fast forward to 1993-1994, and now he's being asked to co-direct a new dinosaur movie for him with Fred Olin Ray. Ray has also made several low-budget films that he's been making since the early 70s. He has about 200 films under his belt, and as a result of being in this part of the industry, he is a Corman superfan, as he puts it himself and it was a dream of his to work on a movie for him. He eventually got to live that dream with Dinosaur Island, as this would be the first movie that he would make under Corman. According to Wynorski, after Jurassic Park came out, Roger got myself and Fred Olin Ray to direct Dinosaur Island. It wasn't so much a Jurassic Park ripoff as sort of a cavewoman movie. Jurassic Park's success was the driving force that got these guys to make Dinosaur Island, but the actual inspiration included another older cavewoman movie from the 50s called Untamed Women. That and the comic book series Star Spangled War Stories, which featured World War II soldiers that get stranded on an uncharted island in the South Pacific and have to fight off dinosaurs. And according to Ray, the movie was initially planned to be a bit different than what the final product ended up being. The film originally started out as sort of a 1940s thing with World War II soldiers as opposed to modern day. But Roger thought modern day would be better, and they wanted it a little more comical than we originally anticipated. However, the main intent of the film was always going to be featuring scantily clad cave women, because Ray would also say, Every time you wished Raquel Welch's or Martine Beswick's top would pop off and didn't, well, now it does. Yeah, this movie may have been inspired by a 50s cave women flick, but like Carnosaur, it has a very 90s attitude, meaning the cave women are not going to be depicted with very much clothing. In fact, the movie features several instances of nudity and even a couple of graphic sex scenes. The screenplay for the movie would be written by Bob Sheridan and Christopher Wooden, and when it came time to shoot it, the crew would grab the dinosaur props and head out to a couple of different filming locations, including the Leo Carrillo State Beach in LA, which is where 1959's Journey to the Center of the Earth shot their beach sequences at. They only filmed here for a day, then packed up and moved to shoot at Vasquez Rocks north of San Fernando Valley, where they would also shoot on David Carradine's ranch. There's also one part 
part of the movie where the soldiers are venturing around the land and they come across these strange looking plants. These were actually leftover vegetation props that were originally featured in the Flintstones movie that was also released in 1994. But they weren't taken out yet, so the film crew was like, fuck it, and recorded a shot with them. And as part of normal Corman tradition, they had a pretty short schedule, only having 10 days to film the movie. But they'd get the film done and ready to go. And this is what resulted from it. The movie begins with a cavewoman being sacrificed to stock footage of the Carnosaur T-Rex. But in this world, the tribe refer to the dinosaur as the Great One, which they have to feed a sacrifice to to keep it from destroying their village and devouring everyone else. Luckily, the tribe have some level of hope when a group of soldiers crash their plane near the beaches of the island, where they encounter their first dinosaur in the form of a Deinonychus puppet from the Carnosaur movie. So there's a bit of a story to this scene. Initially, the scene actually featured a decent looking stop motion sequence of a Tylosaur that would attack the soldiers and fight off the cavewomen before retreating back into the ocean. One of the best parts of this movie are the stop motion scenes that we see throughout the story, which also includes one with the Triceratops attacking the soldiers, one with a Brontosaurus just kind of chilling and eating, a Pterodactyl standing on a boulder, a strange looking bug creature, and of course, the Tylosaurus attacking the group in the beginning. All of which were made by animation and visual effects director Hal Miles. Now you're probably thinking, wow, Corman really let these guys include scenes of stop motion dinosaurs even though he was very much against doing that for Carnosaur? No, of course not. Corman, for whatever reason, hates the use of stop motion. Maybe he doesn't like the look, or maybe he just doesn't like how long it takes to make, but basically, Hal Miles had some dinosaur puppets that he made for stop motion segments that were to be featured in an educational short called The Dinosaur Zoo. I'm not sure if this short was ever produced, but Miles had suggested using the puppets for Dinosaur Island to Ray. I approached Fred with the concept of doing Dinosaur Island with stop motion dinosaurs, at which time he told me that Roger Corman wanted the T-Rex that John Beekler had built for Carnosaur to be in this picture. But considering the props were only of two dinosaurs, the Deinonychus and the Tyrannosaurus Rex, there was room to add in more and Ray and Wynorski came around to the idea of including these stop motion segments. In total, Miles would animate 43 stop motion shots of the dinosaurs, which he shot separately, then he would composite it into the main film in post. But like I said earlier, Corman Corman wanted to use his Carnosaur props as much as possible to get his money's worth out of them. So by the time the film finished up with post-production, that cool Harryhausen styled Tylosaur sequence was cut out and instead replaced with the Deinonychus puppet eating an action figure that was shot in Beekler's parking lot. What was even sadder about all of this was that 21 of those 43 stop motion shots were of the Tylosaur that ended up being cut meaning all of that work went down the drain. Miles was unsurprisingly not informed on these changes, and when he went to watch the movie after it was finally done, he was disappointed with it, as he explained his perspective of the story during an interview. So I'm at the cast and crew screening, and I'm going, okay, great, the first big sequence is coming up. And then, it's this hand puppet. It was kind of disappointing. Even Ray expresses that he liked the original version and wants to re-edit it back into the movie. However, due to licensing issues with the film, he wasn't allowed to make or redistribute those kinds of changes. He did say that he attempted to reach out to Corman about it, and it did seem like he was willing to let Ray make some changes due to what was written in their contract, but he changed his mind last minute, as allowing Ray to have the film would break up his library of work, which which he didn't want to do. That was until Shout Factory came onto the scene, but we'll talk about that later. Also, real quick, while we're on the topic of these stop motion parts, in the movie's end credits, they actually give a special thanks to Ray Harryhausen. But Harryhausen himself would later confirm that he didn't work on this film at all, and that he thinks it was more of an homage thing. I thought that was a funny little bit about the movie that was worth mentioning. Anyways, the women are able to shoo the, I guess, aquatic Deinonychus 
Atlantis away, and the soldiers follow them back to their village, where they meet the tribe's queen. At first, the queen sends them to be killed, but it's revealed one of the soldiers has a special mark. A yellow smiley face that's displayed on the tribe's sacred scroll, which predicts that gods will come to save their tribe from starvation and the wrath of the Great One. So the soldiers are given their weapons back, and set off to go fight what they think is the Great One, but really just a stop-motion Triceratops that kills one of their men but gets gunned down. In a later scene, we actually see the Triceratops' dead body used in a forced perspective shot, where the dinosaur is closer to the camera than the soldiers to make it seem bigger than it actually is. Force perspective is actually used quite a bit throughout the film, which includes the T-Rex rod puppet from Carnosaur. In fact, the movie uses most of the dinosaur practical effects from or meant to be in Carnosaur, including the full-scale T-Rex and even the T-Rex suit that was made as a backup but never used in the first movie. Though working with the suit was apparently a pain in the ass, on account of it being extremely heavy to walk around in. And while we're on the topic of reused assets from Carnosaur, I noticed something very interesting while watching the movie. So the queen lets the soldiers live because even though they killed the wrong dinosaur, it could still be used as food for their starving tribe. So the soldiers start mingling with the women and one of them, whose name is John Schemer played by Richard Gabai, attempts to hunt a pterodactyl for one of the women that he named April. The pterodactyl, like I mentioned earlier, is shown to be a stop motion animation. However, close up shots show a physical pterodactyl puppet. I'm convinced this is the same pterodactyl that shows up in some of the behind the scenes footage for Carnosaur and that's referenced in the dinosaur movie books and magazines, but was never actually shot for the film. And the reason why I think this is because Miles initially had his own animated close ups of the pterosaur preening itself but it was cut out and replaced with this puppet. And it makes sense because Corman did the exact same thing earlier with the Deinonychus puppet for the Tylosaur because he wanted to use as much of the Carnosaur assets as he could to save money. And this is corroborated by the fact that the T-Rex suit that was unused in Carnosaur was brought into this movie so that it wasn't an entire waste of money to make. It would also make sense for him to want to use the pterodactyl puppet for this reason as well, since it too was never featured in the first movie. Initially, I didn't even know if the pterodactyl puppet was even fully made. The most we ever saw of it was a cast and a clay model, which admittedly doesn't look exactly the same as the hand puppet, but who knows, maybe changes were made to it before we got to see it in its final form. But lastly, and probably the most damning thing, knowing what we know about Corman, it's hard to believe he would make an entire pterodactyl puppet from scratch just to be featured in a 30 second scene, if that. This puppet is definitely used, and if it's used, then surely it came from the rest of the Carnosaur assets. Meaning it has to be the one that was made for the final scene of the movie that they never got around to shooting. I'll admit, I couldn't find a source to confirm this, but personally, I'm convinced. That being said, I could also be wrong too. Maybe this pterodactyl belonged to a different production that was borrowed for this movie. That was the case for the cave monster that shows up in a later scene. Turns out, this creature was an alien from one of Ray's older movies from the 80s called Deep Space. If you guys know anything else about it, let me know in the comments down below. Anyways, the soldiers fall in love with some of the cave women, and they learn about the island's true nature. Turns out, the quote-unquote water's volcanic origins gives it this regenerative power that heals wounds as well as keeping all of the island's inhabitants young and healthy, allowing the women to reach ages that could be in the thousands, and it also explains why dinosaurs are still roaming around despite it being modern day. With that out of the way, the soldiers still have to go fight off the Great One, so they and their cave women partners all set out together to fight and kill it, which they do by luring it out in the open using one of the cave women as bait and manage to kill it using a stick grenade that they throw into the T-Rex's mouth blowing it up and putting it down for good. The movie ends with Schemer and April getting married and everyone else living happily ever after. In total, the movie cost $190,000 to make, and Wynorski, Ray, and everyone else on set were clearly having a good time. According to what Wynorski had to say about his experience, he said, Fred and I co-directed. Fred would say, I want to do these scenes. And I'd say, okay, I'll go hang out with the chicks in the trailers. And then we would change off. 
He'd come back, and I'd say, Okay, go ahead and take a rest, Fred. I'll take over. We made the film in 10 days. I thought it came out pretty well. However, Corman didn't feel the same way. Wynorski confirmed that Corman ended up hating the film because he thought the girls weren't pretty and the story was too campy. Personally, while I don't think it's a good movie either, I was honestly expecting it to be way worse than it actually was. It was a dumb movie, but it had funny moments here and there, and I really liked the stop motion sequences. And even though Corman didn't like it, it still seemed to do well, though I don't know exactly how much it made. But whatever, because the following year in 1995, the first Carnosaur sequel would be released. The first Carnosaur was Concord New Horizons' most successful film, and according to the 10th issue of Fangoria Spectacular Horror, it reportedly made over $10 million total by the beginning of 1995. And in the movie industry, where there's success, there is the inevitable sequel. In fact, according to the American Film Institute, Corman announced the sequel as early as October of 1993, and that production was going to begin in the following year. Corman would continue working as this franchise's executive producer, and he would get Louis or Louis Morneau to direct Carnosaur 2. Morneau is a movie writer and director that would start off making short films and music videos, but somewhere down the line he started working for Corman, making trailers for him before he eventually started making movies under him, and eventually he would branch out and contribute on a variety of films like Quake, Retroactive, Joyride 2, and Werewolf the Beast Among us. Initially, Morno was meant to direct the first Carnosaur, but had to pass up the offer due to being busy with another project. But he seemed to express a lot of interest when it came to making a monster movie. So when Corman would offer him the opportunity to direct Carnosaur 2, he took it. When talking about the Carnosaur movies, he states, I thought the first Carnosaur was actually quite sophisticated and ambitious, but ultimately I felt it was trying to accomplish too much. Normally, films at this level either end up going for the straight horror and thrills, or trying to make the whole thing appear campy. I went for horror. There is humor, but it's aliens type humor which plays as an outgrowth of the tension. It was rumored that Morno was given a budget somewhere between $800,000 and $1.5 million to complete this movie. And as far as the schedule went, it was the standard 18 day shooting schedule, so he had to be efficient with his time. Mike Elliott would return to produce it, and a Michael Palmer would be brought in to work on the screenplay. Apparently, Palmer was selected to write the sequel even before the first movie was finished. Corman suspected early on that Carnosaur would be a success, and he wanted to be ready with the sequel, so he had Palmer write an outline. It would take Palmer about three weeks to write out his first draft, and what followed were two rewrites, but after that, the film was ready for its next steps. The idea for the second movie was that it was supposed to be a departure of the first film, both in story and in tone. Where the first film was more of a straight horror flick, the second one was to be more action oriented with the main focus being on the raptors. In it, the characters would do a lot of running and jumping, there would be a lot of explosions and close calls. The movie would still feature the T-Rex, but it was purposely saved to be in only a few scenes so that the focus was kept on the raptors. As far as the effects department went, Magical Media Studios would return to update the dinosaur models for the sequel. Beekler wasn't the biggest fan with how the first movie came out. Despite Simon being a good writer, he felt that the locations weren't used to their fullest potential, and didn't like that the planned content that he had in mind was never shot at all. Even with that, he still goes on to say, I didn't have a bad experience with Roger. He pretty well knew what went on, and that's why he gave me more of a free reign in the second movie. But, as per usual, assets from the first film were to be reused in the second. But there was a bit of a problem with this. The dinosaur props had been sitting in storage for about a year at this point. The materials they were built with didn't really last too long, and along with that, some of the props were probably still a bit beaten up from their use in the first movie, so they were deteriorating and needed to be refurbished. According to Beekler, now they were a year older, and I mean, foam latex had a shelf life. 
life, and mechanical parts don't move as accurately after a year. Basically, it was a matter of wiping off the dust and trying to glue the cracks in the foam together. During the refurbishing process, Ted Haynes was also brought back, but only for about six weeks of the movie's pre-production. When he was brought back, the team not only refurbished a lot of the deteriorating material, but also updated the raptors, turning them from Deinonychus's to Velociraptors this time around. According to Palinkus' article from the Lost Films fanzine, interestingly enough, the Deinonychus was replaced by Velociraptors due to the awareness and popularity of Jurassic Park's raptors. This was confirmed by John Foster, the supervisor for the Beekler shop, who said they built the raptor costume to be more articulated and resemble more like the one from Jurassic Park. This is also confirmed in the fanzine, Magical Media Industries used the exact same Deinonychus costume molds to create the bodies for the raptor costumes. Only the heads and necks were changed to reflect the longer neck and snout that distinguished the two dinosaurs. Haynes had no idea where to even begin with the mechanics for the Velociraptors, so he would end up contacting a friend named Jeff Edwards who actually worked on the Velociraptors for Jurassic Park. I had worked with um, the mechanic uh, Jeff Edwards mm -hmm. over at K&B, because yeah, I had definitely been at K&B and Jeff had already built the dinosaur for Jurassic Park and he had worked on raptors. Uh. And I said, I gotta go over to Beekler's and build a raptor. How'd you do the mechanics for that? Because I have no <laughs> idea what. And he drew out the whole parallelogram, yeah. like how to do it oh, and stuff wow. like that. And I remember sharing it with Scott going, the guy who built the raptors for Jurassic gave me this. And he was like, that's cool. Like, <laughs> You know, he tried to reproduce it as best as he could. I also have to admit, the Velociraptors, in my opinion, look more terrifying in this movie than the Deinonychus from the first. I think it's the uncanny look from their eyes that freaks me out a bit. Regardless of this, Haynes wasn't the biggest fan of his work on this movie. However, Morneau himself praised the dinosaur effects. According to him, the dinosaurs looked believable, and he felt like they didn't need to worry about hiding them with quick cuts and insert shots. Anthony Dublin was also brought back to work on the miniature sets for the sequel, and he noted that the director wasn't very present, at least not when he was working on the miniatures, but he didn't seem to care. Carnosaur 2 is actually probably the most fun I've ever had making anything. I mean, just fun, you know. Um, I got left alone. The director, I don't know what he was doing, but he wasn't there. So basically, they gave me five cameras, all the short ends I could eat, a little bit of a crew. I had a earth moving equipment, a dinosaur, and uh, a bunch of storyboards, and we shot for three days, you know. And uh, I wasn't bothered by anybody. <laughs> Some of the actors that were selected for this film were people that had worked with Corman previously, like Don Stroud and Cliff D. Young. But I mainly bring up the actors because there's this funny rumor about John Savage specifically, who plays the leading role, that I literally could not find a solid source for. The rumor simply goes that he was drunk for most of the filming for Carnosaur 2, but I really can't find anywhere that says that beyond IMDb trivia, and based on my experiences using this to gather information, it should should be taken with a grain of salt. Of course, if anyone out there knows more about it, or maybe has the original source from where this came from, I'd love to know. Oh, and uh, while we're on the topic of the actors, Rick Dean is literally the best part of this movie, hands down. Whoa, mind me, dine me, 69 lay. Anyways, that's pretty much the bulk of what I can find for the behind the scenes of Carnosaur 2. It became very apparent in my research that as the sequels progressed, there was less and less that was really said about them. And it makes sense, considering the first Carnosaur was when pretty much everything was created. And the movies from this point on just reuses the props and they had less money to work with, so all they want to do is film and get the movie out and call it a day. Not much can really be said about that, unfortunately. Anyways, regarding Carnosaur 2's release, according to the fanzine article, it was initially supposed to get a theatrical release, and apparently there were some rumors that say it did. However, from all of the sources that I've seen, the movie had a direct-to-video release in February of 1995. From what I can gather, the overall reception it's garnered over the years has been relatively positive, with many people, including myself, preferring it over the first movie. And what's funny about Carnosaur 2 is that, in case you couldn't already tell, Hell, one of the most common things mentioned about it is its obvious similarities with Aliens. What's even funnier about this is that James Cameron, the director of Aliens,
Williams, used to work for Corman before he made it big in the industry. I wouldn't be surprised if he decided to pay his debt to Corman by simply looking the other way after this film was released, but as we go through it, it will be very obvious that this was just a ripoff of Aliens, which the people who worked on it are well aware of. They don't try to deny it. And yes, we can call this a ripoff because there's more than enough similarities within it to call it a cheaper imitation of the original product. After discovering messed up electrical wiring within the government-controlled underground uranium mining facility of the Yucca Mountain, the workers at the facility contact a group of electricians to come check out the problem. Before the electricians arrive, all of the workers are murdered by an unseen attacker, save for a boy named Jesse, the nephew of one of the workers, who was able to hide during the attack. Meanwhile, the electricians, made up of a group of five people, including Reed, Monk, Moses, and Rollins, all led by their boss, Kahane, are called in by a government representative named Tom McQuaid from the Defense Department, who's sent to guide them within the base to locate the problem. They get to the base via helicopter, but when they get no response from anyone inside, they investigate it themselves, finding a huge mess, a lot of blood, and Jesse, who's in shock after witnessing the attack. The team don't feel safe in the facility, facility and want to leave, but McQuaid forces them to continue working on the problem. But the problem seemed to originate in the lower sectors of the mine restricted to civilians. The electricians go down there anyways where they're attacked by velociraptors. This attack gets Kahane and Moses killed and sends Galloway, the helicopter pilot, off to get the chopper started for their escape. Unfortunately for her, one of the raptors managed to get on board without her knowing and kills her from behind, causing the chopper to crash and explode. With their only mode of transportation gone, the rest of the crew bunker inside the base's control room, where they press McQuaid for answers. Turns out, the movie takes place a couple of months after the events of the first film, though there aren't really any specifics given about it. All McQuaid says is that a biotech firm started messing around with ancient DNA from fossilized material and found a a way to bring back dinosaurs, only for those dinosaurs to get loose and kill a bunch of people before a team was sent in to shut the whole thing down. About a week or two after this shutdown, the team would discover and confiscate several nests of eggs, which they then transported and kept in this underground facility. Nowhere does he mention it was specifically Dr. Tiptree that brought the dinosaurs to life, nor does he mention the virus that she made alongside the dinosaurs, or her intent as to why she made it. And he doesn't mention the security measures the team had to carry out in order to keep the virus from spreading. To be fair though, it's possible he doesn't actually know anything about it, and even if he did, he's probably unable to tell the full details since he does work for the government. And it's also for that reason he refuses to let the team do any damage to the facility after they discover a room carrying a bunch of dynamite that they can use to kill the dinosaurs with. Though part of it is because this uranium mine is also a storage facility for nukes and warheads left over from the Cold War. And what's worse, the dinosaurs seem to be interfering with the weaponry, leading to a repository failure that can destroy the whole facility in a matter of a couple of hours. So the team devise a plan to get help and trap the dinosaurs in the lower levels. But this ends up failing as the raptors only get closer and closer to the control room, forcing the team to make a run for it to the surface. Rollins, Monk, and McQuaid are killed in the process, but Reed and Jesse press on, eventually running into the T-Rex. They manage to get away from it and make it to the surface, where a group of men in an evac chopper help them, but are threatened when the T-Rex finds its own way to the surface and breaks out of the facility. Jesse goes off to find the skip loader and proceeds to fight the T-Rex off in yet another battle sequence that mimics Aliens and, you know, the first Carnosaur movie. He forces the T-Rex towards the facility entrance and pushes it down the shaft to its death. Jesse goes back to the helicopter, and the movie ends with him blowing up the facility as he and Reed fly off to safety. So like I said before, Carnosaur 2 is basically the dinosaur equivalent of aliens. A group of electricians are sent to check out some electrical problems at an unresponsive government facility that's been overtaken by raptors, just like Ripley is sent in with a group of marines to check out an unresponsive colony that's been overtaken by aliens. The group of electricians investigate the base, finding a teenage boy who managed to survive the initial attack of raptors. The group of marines investigate the colony, finding a little girl who managed 
manage to survive the initial attack of aliens. When things start to look bleak, the electricians attempt to escape the facility, but their only mode of transportation, that being a helicopter, is destroyed after a raptor attacks and kills the pilot from the inside. When things start to look bleak for the marines, they attempt to escape the overran colony, but their only mode of transportation, that being an evac ship, is destroyed after an alien attacks and kills the pilot from the inside. The electricians are led by a government suit who's heavily against the idea of blowing up the facility and interferes when the rest of the crew attempt this. The marines are led by a company suit who's heavily against the idea of destroying any of the facehuggers and interferes when the rest of the group disagrees. When shit hits the fan, the raptors swarm the control room, forcing the survivors to flee, causing several deaths, but a couple of them manage to escape, with Jesse using the skip loader to fight off the T-Rex and pushing it down the facility shaft. When shit hits the fan, the aliens swarm the marines, forcing the survivors to flee, causing several deaths, but a few of them manage to escape, with Ripley using using the power loader mech to fight off the alien queen and throws her down the pod bay. There's probably more similarities that I'm missing, but you get the point. In my personal opinion, I really like this movie, and would even go as far as to say it's my personal favorite in the franchise. I don't even care that it's an Aliens ripoff. In fact, for me personally, that makes the movie even better. James Cameron's Aliens but with dinosaurs. Why should I complain about that? My issue with the first Carnosaur movie is that even though Simon tried his best with what he had, it still comes off as way too serious for the concept it has. Carnosaur 2 seems to be way more aware of what it actually is. It's an unoriginal B-movie, and it has fun with it. It's faster paced, the characters are very enjoyable, the movie has a good balance of humor and serious moments. That's not to say the first film was really all that terrible, because looking at it now, I don't think it's terrible, but I think Carnosaur 2 improves where Carnosaur 1 failed. And I'm not the only one who feels this way. Beekler also thinks the sequel did a better job in some areas. They shot a little bit longer, and the locations certainly were more grand. They're the same dinosaurs, they're just shot in the way they were designed to be shot. And in general, most of the reception I've seen for this movie has been somewhat positive, with a lot of people saying that they prefer it over the first one. That being said, the movie did have its fair share of criticism, with many people thinking the effects weren't that good or convincing, and others not really liking that it ripped off aliens. On top of that, Carnosaur 2 didn't make the sales, at least not nearly the sales as the first one made, but clearly enough to spawn one more sequel. In the following year of 1996, another sequel to Carnosaur would be made, titled Carnosaur 3 Primal Species. Now, it was hard enough to try to find stuff for Carnosaur 2 for this video, but trying to find anything for Carnosaur 3 was a challenge. Whereas the first movie will forever be popular due to its release coinciding with what would become the highest grossing movie of its time, and the second one is remembered as being a somewhat competent follow-up to the first, as it improved on many aspects, this third installment was just straight up forgettable. Not just to me, but seemingly most people as well. It's the least talked about Carnosaur film and it had the least amount of information on it, probably due to the fact that by this point, Corman was beginning to feel like Carnosaur had run its course. Not in terms of story, mind you, but in profits. This final part marks the last movie to be able to gain any kind of profit for the franchise, because anything beyond it meant diminished profit and Corman didn't want to waste his time on films that would make little to no money. And because Corman knew this movie was not going to make much, he unsurprisingly went very cheap with it. Corman would get Jonathan Winfrey to direct the movie, a producer and director who has his own catalog of B-movies as well from over the years including Black Scorpion, Legend of the Lost Tomb, and Christmas Ice Tastrophe. According to Beekler, Winfrey was a talented guy, but he was faced with the challenge of having nothing to work with for this movie. The first film did well, the second didn't, and because of that, the third movie suffered the worst when it came to budget. Assets from the previous two movies were heavily used, no surprise there, which were once again polished by the good people from Magical Media Industries. Dublin would also be back for some visual effects work, and the screenplay was written by Scott Sandin. 
So while I was researching for this movie, I ran into a rumor about it, and I call it a rumor because I've yet to find any reliable source that substantiates this claim, but apparently this movie initially went by the title of just Primal Species because it was never supposed to be a part of the Carnosaur franchise at all. And I guess it was just gonna be its own standalone dinosaur movie before it was decided to just slap on the Carnosaur title, call it the third installment to the franchise, and call it a day. I've heard some people say that this is corroborated by the fact that other parts of the world just use this primal species title, like the UK cover for example. But really, it's not uncommon for international titles to be different variations of the original title. All three of the Carnosaur films have been called something else in different parts of the world. The German cover for the first Carnosaur movie was called Carnosaurus, the Ecuadorian cover for Carnosaur 2 was called Carnosaur Park, the German cover called it Carnosaurus Attack of the Raptors, the French cover literally translates to Mutant Species. For the third movie, it takes even more of a departure, with the Japanese cover calling it Dinosaur Crisis 3, and the Czech cover simply calling it Transport. So yeah, I think the UK calling their movie Primal Species is just a case of them simplifying or differentiating from the original title. Rather than serving as proof, it was this movie that was never meant to be a part of the Carnosaur franchise in the first place. And while admittedly there really isn't much information on Carnosaur 3 out there, that also includes a lack of a source for this claim. Most of what I was able to find on this movie was in the dinosaur filmography, where Beekler talks about it for a bit, saying they had to film on Roger's little stage as he describes it, which I'm assuming was his warehouse or something, but they also filmed on a ship for about a day or two for all of the scenes in the latter half of the movie. I kid you not, that's pretty much all I could find on Carnosaur 3. It really just comes off as if no one cared about this movie. But whatever, let's take a look at it. The movie begins with a promising start to a dinosaur B-movie, with a military convoy being attacked by a group of terrorists who hijack the trucks thinking they're loaded with uranium. They take the trucks back to a warehouse by an LA dock and open it up, finding not uranium, but dormant raptors. Alright, for a B-movie, I like this idea. A group of terrorists accidentally unleash some dinosaurs, and now both the US military and a group of terrorists have to fight them off. This honestly just sounds like a fun idea for a dinosaur B-movie. It sounds like it could be really enjoyable. And the terrorists are dead. I suppose that's a good thing, but there goes that potential batshit insane plot that could have at least made this movie more fun. Instead, the terrorists get slaughtered and the dinosaurs are now loose around the warehouse. A team of anti-terrorist special forces are sent in to handle the situation, one of them being Rick Dean, who played Monk in the second movie. Corman reusing actors to play multiple characters characters in a single franchise isn't something to be surprised about. There is examples of Corman films out there where he used the same actor to play more than one character in a single movie. And while Dean isn't nearly as good in this movie as he was in the second, he's definitely one of the better aspects of Carnosaur 3 in my opinion. Anyways, the team is sent in, but their initial inspection of the warehouse leaves two of their soldiers dead, forcing the last three, Polchek, Sanders, and Colonel Higgins, to retreat back to base. There, they meet scientist Dr. Hodges, who fills them in on everything about the dinosaurs. And when I mean everything, I mean not really anything. Because this movie kind of sort of ignores almost all of the events from the last two except for one part where they once again reference Tiptree, this time as a brilliant but troubled geneticist. What's funny about this is that Tiptree recreated dinosaurs for the sake of killing off the human race, but in this movie, the reason why they want to capture the last remaining dinosaurs alive is because, and I quote, within their regenerative DNA structure lie the answers to curing major diseases. And it could, and I also quote, save millions of lives. Sounds a bit counterintuitive for what Tipchi was going for. Continuing, Hodges gives them a rundown of the dinosaurs they're dealing with, and I kid you not, she says this. It's best not to underestimate the carnosaur's intelligence, as they all exhibit some human DNA. Don't get your hopes up for anything interesting out of this though, because it doesn't really get brought up again. They do imply throughout the movie that the raptors are getting smarter, and this human intelligence thing is supposed to be the crutch for that idea, and that's it. Well that, and I guess it is supposed to be a continuation of Tiptree's idea from the first movie. You know, the possibility of dinosaurs having the same level of intelligence as humans, but even that's not really expanded much in this movie. 
Anyways, the three men are sent back to the docks to capture the dinosaurs, and after a close call, they run into a group of marines who were also sent in to aid Higgins and his men. So together, the group try to devise a plan to capture the dinosaurs by using meat and netting to trap it. But this ends up failing when one of the raptors distracts them while the other grabs Polchek. The men are able to gun down the raptor while the other escapes. But they take the dead specimen for Hodges to study, where she finds out the cells of the dinosaurs are repairing them themselves. She then goes on to say that there are two generations of carnosaurs. The first generation refers to the ones that were created in the first movie, and as McQuaid explained in part two, the government team that was sent in to clean everything up would find several nests of eggs, which they saved and they hatched in the Yucca Mountain base. Those are the second generation carnosaurs, and the final three that Higgins and his crew are assigned to hunt down are the last of that second generation. What's actually kind of cool about about this movie is that Hodges acknowledges it. Not in any specific detail, mind you, but it's nice to see this movie isn't completely ignoring the first two. The team finds out the dinosaurs have settled inside a ship, with the T-Rex using it to house its eggs because it was able to reproduce asexually. So their next plan of attack is to take the ship out to sea and immobilize the dinosaurs while they have them isolated. However, this plan also fails because the dinosaur ends up killing almost half their team, so Higgins decides to just blow up the ship with C4. As they set the charges, more soldiers are killed, leaving just Higgins and Hodges left to battle the T-Rex, which they put down for good after throwing some C4 into its mouth and detonating it, completely blowing off its head. This detonation of that charge detonates all of the other charges, so as the charges go off, Higgins and Hodges make a run for it to the upper deck of the ship and jump off. While these guys were able to make it, the movie ends with some sequel bait that will never happen. Carnosaur 3 marks the end of the main Carnosaur series. It wasn't the greatest send-off, but from a business perspective, it made sense why they stopped it at part 3. During that Dinner with Five interview with Roger Corman, he actually mentioned the Carnosaur series, telling everyone at the table that they decided to stop at 3 because Carnosaur 4 and 5 wouldn't have made very much money. And even on more commercial subjects, when we did Carnosaur, which came out just before Jurassic Park, you could almost draw a graph. If you say the cost of the picture is here, and your grosses are here, the gross on the first Carnosaur was there. The second one was here. Sure. The cost, third one was but, but there. But your budgets on each go no, up, though. On that they? one, we held the budgets <laughs> level. And I would draw a graph. We went to Carnosaur 5, and our profit was this much. And I said, that's fine. We've had a great run, there will never be a, be a Carnosaur, carnosaur 6. six. <laughs> Beekler seemed to have a different sentiment to this. As he said, people were so disappointed by the lack of a movie in the first one. So even though Carnosaur 2 was 10 times the movie the first one was, it didn't make the sales. I would say that if Carnosaur 2 was the first movie, they'd still be making Carnosaur movies. While it's sad there isn't going to be any more Carnosaur movies from here on out, the spirit of Carnosaur lived on in different ways. Mainly with assets being reused in one way or another for other projects. For example, according to that Jeff Farley interview from earlier, Beekler worked on a Tarzan show in 1997 called Tarzan the Epic Adventures. But, uh, but John took the Deinonychus puppet, um, or took castings out of the Deinonychus puppet a few years afterwards and turned it into a plesiosaur creature for, um, for the Tarzan show he was working on. The specific episode that Farley is referring to is called Tarzan and the Mystery of the Lake, which aired on May 18th, 1997, where Tarzan encounters a mysterious serpent that has the slightly altered face of the Velociraptor head mold, specifically from the second and third Carnosaur movie. Throughout the mid to late 90s, Corman had partnered with Showtime, a TV network that was fixed on showcasing works from the sci-fi and or horror genre at the time, to create a series of low-budget movies that would feature on the network's channel. This series of movies was made under the title of Roger Corman Presents, and it lasted two seasons. Season 1 had 13 total movies made for it that ranged from the mid to late months of 1995. Season 2 had 17 movies made within mid-1996 to late 1997. 
And the final movie to be featured in Season 2 of Roger Corman Presents was called The Haunted Sea, which came out on November 17th, 1997. The movie is centered around a group of sailors that come across an empty ship at sea. When they board this mysterious ship, they find Aztec treasures that possesses one of the crew members, turning him into a reptilian monster thing that then kills off the crew one by one. Not only does the movie reuse stock footage from the second Carnosaur movie in the beginning to show that the crew that used to occupy the now empty ship were killed by an unseen assailant, but the movie also reuses the raptor suit from the second and third Carnosaur movies. But instead of keeping the raptor design unchanged, some modifications were made to the head specifically to give it less of a dinosaurian look and more of a serpent reptile look, along with giving it a sail-like feature that runs down its back to its tail. Interesting use of the raptor suit, but the movie itself was pretty boring in my opinion. I don't know, maybe I'm just getting tired of watching reptilian monsters hunting people within a confined area. But the movie did have one highlight to it. Best movie effects I've ever seen. I love it. But aside from these appearances, that's pretty much the last we would see of the Carnosaur dinosaurs, at least as far as the 90s go. It wouldn't be until November 6th of 2001 when our screens would once again be graced by the familiar sight of the Carnosaur movies, this time in the form of Raptor, which may or may not have been made to capitalize off of the hype of another 2001 dinosaur title known as Jurassic Park 3. So, while Raptor isn't the most documented movie out there, and information about it is pretty scarce, Palinkus was actually able to interview the director of the movie, Jay Andrews, which was a pseudonym for Jim Wynorski. That's right, Corman had once again asked Wynorski to make a dinosaur movie for him. Only this time, Corman gave the director no money but allowed him to use whatever footage he wanted from the Carnosaur trilogy. And that's exactly what Wynorski would do. This wasn't the first time Wynorski put a movie together in this way. And Corman knew this and thought that Wynorski was good at putting clips and footage together from other works to make it feel like a complete film which is why he would choose him to be the director for Raptor. As a result, almost every single dinosaur scene in this movie is just reused footage from Carnosaur 1, 2, and 3. And because of this, people often label Raptor as the unofficial sequel or spin-off to Carnosaur and even go as far as to call it Carnosaur 4. I'm assuming this is more of a joke within the community though, because in all actuality, the film has nothing to do with the story of the first few movies. As far as I know, know it's supposed to serve as its own standalone film. And Palinkas actually brought up an interesting point in his fanzine article on Carnosaur. He points out that Raptor serves more as a reboot to the Carnosaur franchise than a spin-off. Especially since the movie unintentionally does things that are more faithful to the source material. Nothing specific, of course, but in comparison to the first movie, it's definitely closer. Some scenes in the Raptor movie do seem similar to the ones in the book, but we'll get to those similarities in a bit. Going back to Wynorski, he had 10 days to film original scenes with the current cast, which he shot with in a couple of different locations, including Vasquez Rocks once again for some of the outside scenes, and at the LA Department of Water and Power in Silmar for some of the lab scenes. It seems that this was more of a nothing movie to Wynorski. He didn't really care about it and he couldn't wait for it to be finished. It was just a one and done thing for him. He and the rest of the crew were well aware the movie wasn't going to be good, even going as far as to refer to the film as Craptor on set. But is this movie really as bad as people make it? Yes, 100%, absolutely. But that's not going to stop me from going through it. The film is revolved around Sheriff Tanner and animal control officer Barbara Phillips investigating a series of animal attacks that seem to all be pointing to a nearby science facility ran by Dr. Hyde. These animal attacks include reused footage of the teens being attacked from the first Carnosaur movie, reused footage of the truck driver being attacked from the first movie, there's a scene where a deputy is killed that's spliced with scenes of the protesters being killed from the first movie. Yeah, like I said earlier, this movie is filled with reused clips from the previous three. 
I kid you not, even the establishing shots for the beginning credit sequence is just reused footage for the beginning credit sequence from Carnosaur 2. There was a point during my research for this movie where I became very curious about how many scenes in this movie were really reused footage of the original trilogy. So, I kid you not, I spent an entire night going through this entire movie, putting together a list and labeling every single unoriginal scene in this movie to their respective film they originated in. And what I found out is that every single dinosaur scene in this movie is completely unoriginal footage, save for one scene. In the interview, Wynorski said that in terms of dinosaur props and effects, all he had to work with was a rubber dinosaur arm. In the scene where this arm is used, Tanner's daughter meets up with her boyfriend where they do some funny business in the back of his truck in the middle of the woods before they're attacked by a raptor. While her boyfriend gets mauled, she's able to drive off before the raptor teleports all around her, first appearing in front of her crashing through the windshield, but then there's this shot right here, where she's being grabbed by that rubber dinosaur arm that Wynorski had mentioned earlier. What's even funnier about all of this is that in October of 2001, Corman did an interview where he says the dinosaurs from Carnosaur were stored in a warehouse until they decided to do another dinosaur movie and when they got around to making Raptor, he claimed to have taken them out of storage to use for this new dinosaur movie. But again, this is not the case because the only scene that uses original dinosaur footage is literally just a random dinosaur arm. Everything else is from the previous movies. Anyways, Tanner's daughter jumps out of the truck right before it drives off a bridge, which is just reused footage from another Corman-produced movie called Humanoids from the Deep. She's hospitalized and we cut to Dr. Hyde and his team. One of the men, whose name is Lyle, feels guilty about the murders caused by the animals they're responsible for creating and handling and wants to quit. And if you couldn't tell, Lyle is played by Frank Novak who also starred in the original Carnosaur movie as Jesse Paloma. And Novak wasn't the only returning member of the original cast, as Harrison Page, who played Sheriff Fowler in the original, was brought back as well to play Deputy Glover. Turns out, the only reason why these two were hired for this movie in the first place was because Wynorski wanted to repurpose their death scenes from the original movie. So in Raptor, Dr. Hyde tricks Lyle into going towards the T-Rex pen where the dinosaur is released and kills the poor bastard. Then, later on, Deputy Glover responds to a call about someone smashing windows in town, but it turns out to be the raptor. As we saw in the original film, he shoots the raptor down, and right as he goes to put another shot into it, the raptor impales him with its sickle claw. In this version, Glover doesn't blow the raptor's head off, so I think it's implied the raptor killed the officer and left the crime scene. According to Wynorski, neither Page or Novak were very happy about why they were hired for this film. Anyways, Tanner and Barbara are able to get a search warrant for Hyde's facility, but as they tour the building, Barbara stupidly gives up that they know what Hyde's been doing all along, which was, you guessed it, genetically engineering dinosaurs. So Hyde has them locked up but things begin to fall apart quickly for him after the government becomes suspicious of his activities. Turns out, Hyde was a part of a research project for the government 12 years ago that was known as the Jurassic Storm Project. But the whole thing was shut down after an undisclosed incident caused several deaths that were similar to the ones being caused today around Hyde's current facility. Also, because I feel like people might try to connect the two, I just want to say, I don't think the Jurassic Storm Project is referring to the first movie at all. All. By the way the colonel is describing the events that took place 12 years ago, it seems that the government was well aware of what was going on, and Hyde was supervising the project. This doesn't at all align with any of the events in the original Carnosaur because in that one, the government didn't know about Tiptree's experiments and as far as we're concerned, she worked with a very limited set of people and I doubt Hyde was one of them. Even though they could have retconned it, I suppose. But I think the Jurassic Storm Project is supposed to be an incident unique to, and only to, the Raptor movie. 
Government officials do some background checks and find out Hyde is working with genetically engineered dinosaurs again through means of foreign funding. So they send in two special ops teams to go shut down his operations by planting explosives within the facility. Oh yeah, and among this group of special ops is Richard Gabai, who we last saw being frisky with the cave women on Dinosaur Island several years back. Breakfast, 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 breakfast. Hyde unleashes the dinosaurs on the men right as Tanner and Barbara are able to escape and join up with the surviving military team. During the attack, Karen, Hyde's assistant, is killed by a raptor. But really, it's just the scene of Rollins' death from the second film. Everyone is able to make it out of the facility, even Hyde, but right as he steps outside, he sees the T-Rex has also found its way out and gets eaten by it. Wanting to prevent it from escaping, Tanner gets into a bobcat, which, by the way, according to Wynorski, nobody, not even the guy who brought the bobcat for this scene, knew how to drive it. And apparently, when Eric Roberts, who plays Sheriff Tanner, tried to drive it, he accidentally backed it up, almost hitting Wynorski's car. But eventually, he would get it down, and he would even develop magical powers too. Because throughout this final fight sequence between the machine and the T-Rex, Tanner is able to switch from a smaller white bobcat to a bigger yellow forklift. Nah, just kidding. These are just reused clips from Carnosaur 1 and 2 poorly put together and mixed with Tanner in a bobcat. Anyways, he pushes the T-Rex back inside the facility and knocks it down the shaft to its death. He and Barbara run away as the explosives go off, destroying the facility from the inside. So the DVD that I bought to use for this video had a commentary track with Wynorski and Melissa Brussel, who played Barbara's character. In that commentary, Wynorski mentioned that there was a scene at the very end that was supposed to happen after Tanner and Barbara embrace, which would feature Hyde and his assistant Karen being cloned and brought back to life in an unnamed Utah facility, so they can continue working on their dinosaur project. And I guess they actually filmed this scene, but the reason why it was cut, at least according to Brussel and Wynorski, is because when that version was shown to Corman, he ended up not liking it, because he felt like there wasn't enough information there to lead up to that ending. Now one of the things I do want to mention is that at the very end of this movie, of course they get rid of the dinosaur, and the whole place blows up. At the end of the movie, at the way it ends now, it just ends in a, the, the lovely couple here have a nice embrace, and it goes to credits. But in the original version, we cut to the Utah facility. And Corbin Brunson and the girl were cloned back to life. And they say, let's go keep working on the dinosaurs. And Roger, who and Roger I totally agree with when I saw the version, said, said that there wasn't enough to... Uh, what, information to lead Exactly, to, to lead to that. All Nobody, right, fine, fine, fine. Nobody fine. bought it. So we cut it, we I cut totally it. agree. Okay. So the DVD version that I have cuts straight to the credits after Tanner and Barbara's embrace. However, when I was talking to Palinkas about this scene, if I remember correctly, he told me they actually featured that version of Raptor with that ending on TV at one point, which is how he saw it. I've yet to come across this version, I don't even know if it exists anywhere on the internet, but if it does, or you guys have any more information about it, do let me know. Hey, so a quick unscripted update here. So as I was trying to find some still images for the movie to edit my video with, I ended up running into Raptor on Internet Archive, and it dawned on me that I didn't even think to look on the Internet Archive when it came down to looking for this version of Raptor with this alternate ending. And I looked through it, and yeah, this Internet Archive rip actually has the alternate ending. It starts off by featuring newspaper clips and news reports of the events that we had pretty much just watched with a voiceover pretty much talking about everything that we just went through before cutting to that Utah base, which is called Eunice, by the way. No, I don't think that has anything to do with Carnosaur 1. I think they just took that name from Carnosaur 1 and just used it for this one for their own project. I don't think it has any kind of connection to it. And just as Wynorski described in the commentary track, a cloned version of Hyde and his assistant Karen wake up from this incubation pod where Hyde tells her that they've still got work to do. And with that, the movie ends. Very cool that I was able to find this. I legit thought that maybe this could have been lost media, but no, it's out there. You can watch it on Internet Archive if you want. But yeah, that was Raptor, and like I mentioned earlier, Palinkas brought up the interesting point in how this film kind of sort of follows similar events and beats from the original book. 
Keep in mind, Wynorski never read the book. So all of this was unintentional, and admittedly, a lot of these are surface-level comparisons. But near the beginning, there was a scene where Tanner's daughter and her boyfriend, who is a lot older than her, are attacked by the raptor after a fuck session in the middle of the woods, that ends up killing the boyfriend and sends Tanner's daughter driving away from the scene before crashing the truck. In the book, a similar scene plays out where a younger couple, a 21-year-old guy and a 15-year-old girl, I believe, Leave, are fooling around before they're attacked by a raptor who kills the boy and sends the girl driving away from the scene before crashing it into a tree and getting herself killed in the process. Tanner and Barbara become suspicious of Dr. Hyde and attempt to get answers by getting a search warrant to his facility before they're captured and held there against their will until the dinosaurs are let loose within the building. In the book, Pascal becomes suspicious of Penward's private zoo and attempts to get answers by going into Penward's estate and finding out his secret before he's captured and held there against his will until the dinosaurs are let loose within the property. In the movie, the situation with the dinosaurs are enough for the military to get involved, and a team of special ops are sent in to deal with the problem. In the book, the situation with the dinosaurs are enough for the British army to get involved and are sent in to deal with the problem. Again, very surface level comparisons, but weirdly, the closest thing to a true film adaptation that we've gotten for the Carnosaur book. Anyways, Raptor was a movie that Wynorski wasn't too crazy about. But Corman loved it, not necessarily because it was good or anything, but because apparently it made a decent amount of money. But that was pretty much the last of what we would see with the Carnosaur assets. At least, for a while. Now, stepping away from the films to focus on Brosnan for a bit, there's really not much the author had said about this franchise up to this point. Whatever he did say about the franchise was only limited to the first movie, and it was in that e-fanzine book that wasn't published until 2007. Aside from that, it seems that he just heavily branched away from the film series, and really just Carnosaur as a whole. Unfortunately for Brosnan, he would end up suffering from his own problems including depression and alcoholism. And it got to a point where his health had declined and his mental state had deteriorated. But then, in 2005, the Easter weekend would go by. But Brosnan would make no contact with his friends or family. This would go on for several more days until, on April 11th, 2005, his friends would go to his house to check up on him. They'd gain access into his home and found the author dead in his bed. John Brosnan had passed away in his sleep at the age of 57 in his home of South Harrow, UK. According to reports, autopsies were made on Brosnan, where the doctors found that he likely passed away from acute pancreatitis, which is when the pancreas becomes inflamed under certain conditions, with the consumption of alcohol being one of them. However, reports mentioned that rumors were being spread that there might have been some foul play involved, but this has never gone anywhere. Despite his struggles, Brosnan's family and colleagues remember him as a disciplined writer, a professional author, and a good friend. And I may be reading into this wrong, but it also seems that Brosnan and his friends had a certain type of dark humor with each other, based on some of the sources that I've read. In one writing piece by a David Langford called Torching John Brosnan, he writes about Brosnan's death and funeral and impact to the writing community. In one part, he writes about how a plastic dinosaur dinosaur toy was put on his casket to symbolize his carnosaur book, and joked about how they put the dinosaur toy there instead of a head sculpt of Roger Corman. And he ends off the article by saying, Inevitably, there's a certain grim irony in enjoying a lavishly boozy party in memory of a friend who died of acute pancreatitis brought on by alcohol-induced liver damage. An interesting and dark way of looking at it for sure, but a part of me feels like Brosnan would look at it the same way. An unofficial James Bond website would also report on Brosnan's death, likely to pay respects for some of his previous writings on the franchise. In the article, they would say, It was perhaps to be expected that Brosnan died alone, as he had lived alone for many years, but he was a continual and welcome presence in many lives, a friend to some and companion to many. He was a funny and surprisingly tough-minded writer. I can't help but feel bad that Brosnan got the short end of the stick when it came to his Carnosaur book. But with how everything went down, he still managed to form a cult following for it, and as you'll see later on, to this day, people are still enjoying his books.
Going back to the movies, however, like I said earlier, we wouldn't see the Carnosaur assets for at least the next five years, because on September 1st of 2006, another movie titled The Eden Formula would be released as a sci-fi original that featured a very familiar looking puppet. That, and it would also reuse some very familiar footage. So it turns out, with the permission of Concord New Horizons, Beekler would try his hand at directing his own dinosaur movie, and as much respect that I have gained for Beekler, and as much love as I've developed for his works and practical effects during my research for this video, I have to be honest, the movie was terrible. Now, unfortunately, there's really not much at all that I can find about it. It seemed that Beekler and everyone else a part of it have completely forgotten about this movie. Of what we do know, Corman and the Concord Company as a whole had no actual involvement with this movie. Aside from allowing Beekler to continue using a T-Rex puppet and a couple of scenes from the original movie, as evident from the special thanks section of the end credits. Instead, this movie was produced by Imageries Entertainment, which, looking into this company, it seems the Eden formula was the only film they worked on. And it was also associated with Fantastical Cinema LLC, a film production company owned by porn producer Peter Davey. I guess Beekler maybe had a film deal with Davey because his company would also produce two other Beekler movies called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Saurian, both of which were released somewhere between 2005 and 2006. Magical Media Industries is unsurprisingly still credited for the creature effects, which we'll talk about more in a bit here, but overall, not much is known about the movie's production. But this wasn't Beekler's first time directing. His directorial debut was all the way back in 1984 with The Dungeon Master. In fact, Beekler was a lot more than just a special effects artist and director. He also wrote, produced, and even acted in a couple of movies. But of the movies he would direct, they weren't exactly top tier quality. He directed movies like Ghoulies 3 and Friday the 13th 7, and of course, The Eden Formula. The other notable thing about it is that it went by the alternative title of Tyrannosaurus Rex in Australia. I have no way to naturally transition to going through the movie's plot, so I'm just gonna get into it. The movie is revolved around a couple of scientists, Parker and Rhonda, who work for a company called Calgoran Industries that funded a research project to develop the Eden formula, which is described on the box cover as this new revolutionary cutting-edge technology that can synthetically reproduce virtually any organ Organism. And what better creature to make than a full-grown Tyrannosaurus Rex? They created a literal dinosaur to show off the potential of the Eden formula, which makes it a very high demanding product. Demanding enough for a rival company to send a team of spies to Calgorin's HQ to steal it. The team is led by Radcliffe, played by none other than Tony Todd, who is undeniably the best part of this film. Radcliffe and his gang plan to not only steal the formula, but also blow up the entire building using a thermite bomb and blame everything on another rival to Calgoran, a woman named Linda who seems to be against the company's ways. Radcliffe plans to use this motive against her, and as his team hack the security system which unlocks every door inside the building, including the vault containing the formula and the door to the T-Rex's enclosure, this leads to the T-Rex escaping in a scene of the dinosaur smashing its head against the wall that's been taken from the first carnosaur for like the third time now. When Parker and Rhonda notice this, they immediately suspect something is wrong, and secure the formula in a temporary hiding place while Radcliffe and his people make their way up the building. A police officer working overtime goes over to check out the building after the emergency alarm is set off, and senses that something is wrong. Eventually, all three parties and the T-Rex meet at the building's base, leading to several deaths including some of Radcliffe's people, Linda, and the police officer. Rhonda is able to get away from the premises in the officer's police car, but Parker and a security guard are caught and held prisoner by Radcliffe. Meanwhile, the T-Rex goes on a rampage throughout Los Angeles, eating people and being pissed off that it's not as good looking as this T-Rex statue. Again, I love Beekler's work, but looking at all of his previous stuff from earlier movies, and looking at the T-Rex puppet for this movie, it's hard to believe they were made by the same man. But that's likely from the outcome of the budget. Plus, force perspective wasn't used for this movie. Instead, the T-Rex puppet is green screened into the movie setting for wide shots 
shots of the dinosaur, and for close-up shots, they seem to be using a T-Rex head that I don't recognize. It's definitely not from the full-scale or suit version of the T-Rex, as the head shape is completely different, and it looks much more flexible and fast-moving. And from the shots that we see from it, it's only the head of the T-Rex. So it's likely this was an original creation for this movie that was only meant for close-up shots. Which if it is, then I'll give props to Beekler because it really doesn't look all that bad. It definitely looks better than the hand puppet in front of a green screen. Rhonda attempts to get help for the situation to no avail, but she does end up finding some teens that are carrying literal fucking dynamite while stealing music stereos out of a truck. While that's happening, Parker is pressed to give up where he hid the formula. He doesn't break, so Radcliffe and his team go search for it themselves, giving Parker and the security guard enough time to escape. But we then find out the security guard was the mole for Radcliffe's operation. But before they're able to subdue Parker and get the formula, he lights it all ablaze. So in a last ditch effort to secure the formula, Radcliffe attempts to full on kidnap Parker, but before they can leave the premises, the T-Rex returns to Kalgoran's HQ after Rhonda uses a bunch of stereos to lead it back. And she even tries to kill the dinosaur using the dynamite those random teenagers had, which leads to the best scene ever made in movie history. This doesn't kill the T-Rex, but when it gets back up, it kills Radcliffe and the rest of his gang, giving Parker and Rhonda a chance to escape and using the detonator that he took off of Radcliffe to blow up the building and kill the T-Rex once and for all. For similar reasons towards Raptor, people often associate this movie as the fifth entry to the Carnosaur franchise due to its use of stock footage from the original three movies, and the fact that the T-Rex hand puppet makes a return, albeit not in a good way. It should be noted that this movie also has nothing to do with the story of the original trilogy. In fact, it's the biggest departure from anything Carnosaur related. Nothing about it resembles the source material, nor does it make any reference to the original movies, besides of course reusing assets from them. That being said, it would have been interesting to hear what Beekler would have had to say about this movie and its production. And speaking of Beekler, in February of 2019, he was reported to have stage 4 prostate cancer, and he and his family had to set up a GoFundMe to pay for medical expenses. Sadly, later that year, it was reported on the GoFundMe page that in March of 2019, Beekler had passed away at the age of 66. During my research for this video, everybody who talked about Beekler only said good things about him, remembering him as a heartwarming and welcoming man. Both inside and outside of the Carnosaur franchise, people had great experiences working with him on all of these different movie projects that simply would not be the same without him. People praised his work, and on his IMDb page, it even mentions that Roger Corman at one point called him the best in the business. Without Beekler, we also wouldn't have the Carnosaur dinosaurs we see today. And we can sit here all day making fun of how they look, but we can't deny that it brought many people a lot of entertainment over the years. Sadly, the Eden formula would be the final movie that had anything to do with Carnosaur, which would get a DVD release in 2007, but aside from that, there's not much else in terms of more movies. And this is likely due in part of the fact that Corman faced some legal issues along the way. So, it seems that the Corman family had been dealing with issues with each other regarding the family business that started all the way back in 2008, when it seemed that money was being taken from a few trust accounts that was under their kids' names, which led the Corman kids, who were adults at this point, to be worried that Concord New Horizons was making illegal financial transactions. When they tried to press their parents on about this, Julie and Roger responded by firing all four of their kids from the company in October of 2009. From what I can see, this was an ongoing issue for years, but that's not exactly where our focus is on. Fast forward to the beginning of spring of 2018. It was reported that Corman had finally sold his Concord New Horizons library of movies to a media distributor company called Shout Factory and a China-based film company called Ace Film HK Company Limited. The library included 270 films and a TV show which the companies had long-term plans for to use these titles to make new content including digital media, merchandise, and remakes. 
As stated in one article, the deal gives Xiao all rights in North America, Europe, Australia, and Russia. Ace takes China, Asia, Africa, and South America. This was exciting news, because since Carnosaur was well a part of that library, it meant it could get some kind of modern treatment of who knows, maybe a re-release, or a continuation, or maybe even a remake. Of course, nothing was set in stone, and everything was actually held aside after the Corman kids intervened with this deal going as far as suing their parents and the companies involved. Turns out, Corman had mentioned in the past that his library and its value would get passed down to his kids. But Mrs. Corman was against this plan, and what ensued was a family ordeal that involved alleged verbal abuse from Julie to Roger, a lawsuit from the Corman kids to their parents, and the uncertainty of the future of the films in the Concord New Horizons library. I'm not gonna get into the full details, please know that what I'm presenting isn't the full story, but it's being mentioned because it does have an effect on the actual topic of the video. If you want to look more into it, I do have some links to the articles that I've read on the matter. That being said, in a February 2020 article by the LA Times, it was briefly confirmed by Corman that the situation was settled and over with, and he didn't want to talk about it beyond that. From what I can see, Shout Factory still holds ownership over the new Concord Horizons library, but nothing regarding Carnosaur has been done or announced. However, what we did end up seeing from them was the first DVD release of 1994's Dinosaur Island. And while I don't know for sure the exact release date, I do know it was sometime after 2019 because in the DVD copy that I have, there's a commentary track with Fred Olin Ray, Jim Wynorski, and Richard Gabai, and in it they mention Beekler's passing, which was in 2019. John Beekler, there's another guy who's not with us anymore. Later in the commentary track, Ray also mentioned Shout Factory. I'm just glad that um, Roger finally sold his uh, library and that uh, the good people at Shout Factory saw it in their hearts to license this film to me after I convinced them that I was the right person to bring this film out. I said, I'm the guy. As a result, they also allowed Ray to include the deleted scenes of the stop-motion Tylosaur attack, and a close-up shot of the Brontosaurus in the special features of the DVD. Though the stop-motion close-up shots of the Pterodactyl weren't included and are still missing, but this was better than nothing. As far as Carnosaur goes though, we've yet to see anything from them. However, this wasn't necessarily the end of Carnosaur. One of the bigger updates was the fact that an independent American publisher called Valancourt Books managed to receive the rights to the Carnosaur book from Tor. As far as the rights for the Carnosaur book goes, it's a bit complicated. So when Brosnan gave the rights to Tor back in 1993 for the US re-release of his book, the rights were never reverted back to him. So Valancourt was able to sign for a sub-license from Tor, who only had trade paperback, hardcover, and ebook rights to it. Currently, the rights to the Carnosaur book are actually split up, with one publisher having the mass market paperback rights and the foreign rights, and Tor having all of the rights that I just mentioned. But this was enough for them to republish the book in September of 2022. And that's the version I ended up getting a few months ago that would inspire me to make this video. Along with a new introduction from Will Erickson, a horror book reviewer that runs the Too Much Horror Fiction blog site, the book also came with new cover art done by Lynn Hansen, who did a fantastic job capturing not just the terror of the dinosaur in the book, but you know, also capturing the dinosaur itself. As much as I love the covers to older books, the ones for Carnosaur were, frankly, pretty boring. They did a better job with them in the 90s, but in my opinion, the 2022 version has the superior cover art. As far as everyone involved with this project goes, Corman is still around and is currently 97 years old. According to an interview in 2022, he stated at the age of 96 that he was only semi-retired. How that status is looking nowadays, I don't really know. But I have to say, after doing this video and researching a bunch on Corman, I've developed a lot of respect for him as a low-budget filmmaker. Even though I don't agree with him on everything that he's done over the years, 
years, but his work ethic and ability to conduct business and managing to learn the many tricks and techniques to filmmaking and finding ways to make it on a low budget is nothing short of admirable. As far as everyone else goes, including Adam Simon, Ted Haynes, Jeff Farley, Jim Wynorski, Fred Olin Ray, they all still seem to be around and active working on all of their respective projects. I wish them all the best and I hope they continue working on great, funny, and or dumb but fun movie related projects. And that's pretty much it. That was the entirety of the Carnosaur franchise. In my opinion, this is not at all a perfect franchise, nor is it even really a good franchise. But it's one that has a lot of potential. It gave us something that we don't get very often. It gave us a much more grim view of dinosaurs, one expressed through horror films. And while it was far from a perfect execution, it provided on what should have been the start of a subgenre of dinosaur movies that could have taken off and delivered on better, even more experimental films. Films that could depict dinosaurs in a scarier, maybe even updated light to show how terrifying the real world dinosaur can be. Films that could have held the same kind of messages that Simon was trying to tell in the first Carnosaur, but better executed. Films that could be meant for a more mature audience and showcase dinosaurs in scenarios that we just can't get in the Jurassic World movies. Unfortunately, we didn't get that in the film industry, but we do have some essence of that through other forms of paleo media. And if this republished version of the book is to tell us anything, it's that people still want to see Carnosaur. Thank you all so much for watching, and Happy Halloween.